you come in? Welcome to our program, From House to House. We appreciate the use of the beautiful home of Chuck and Pat Hansen. We are grateful for the ladies' participation in our filming. We're going to continue on in our 12-part series that we have called Completing the Course, where we're considering the fact that the Lord has laid a race before us to be run as individuals, very unique, very suited to us as He has made us. And that race is a course in which the Lord wants to complete a work in us, that the Christ within us might be developed and matured and manifested in that maturity. The closer we get to the finish line, the more the Word of God should be expressed through us in beautiful ways that His name would be praised. So we're going to deal today with lesson number six, ladies. We're going to call this one, What Do You See?, and we're going to talk about the power that those that were observing the life of the Shulamite in the Song of Solomon, that power they saw in her life. She was to them like a frightening army, awesome, inspiring, captivating. And that's why they said to her, return, return. We want to look upon you some more. They were fascinated with the various godly characteristics they could see in the Shulamite. You say, why are you using the Shulamite, Carol, as an illustration? Because that word means complete, complete. Because we want the Lord to complete the work that He has begun within us. Amen? Song of Solomon, our basic text. Let's go back again, ladies. Song of Solomon 6, verse 13. And we will see the fact that she was being observed as one who looked as though there were two armies standing there. Return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon thee. She asked the question, what will ye see in the Shulamite? The answer is, as it were the company of two armies. Not one army, but two armies. There was a double army. There was the backup. There was the reinforcement behind her life. Now, we can liken this to us as an individual and see our individual growth in the Lord as the Lord is endeavoring to complete that work in us as individuals. Or we could see this picture very suited to the whole body of Christ, the bride, the church, various terms we might refer to as the body of believers. But what are you going to see in her? One of the things you will see is the power of God in this life, not her power, God's power. Now, I want us to go to Song of Solomon 6, verse 10. And it says, Who is she that looketh forth as the morning? We've talked about that. Her being as one that appears with the hope of the breaking of a new day, as beautiful as the moon, and as clear as the sun, her clarity. And this fourth thing we want to talk about that could be seen in her life was that she appeared as terrible as an army with banners. Now, I need to clarify that word terrible in our vocabulary. We could think of various ways we would use that word terrible. But here in the scripture, what is meaning is that she is as frightening, as awesome, as captivating as an army with its banners. And no doubt its banners held very high. The enemy should be able to see when it looks upon the church that the church is as a double army, as terrible, as frightening, as captivating, as inspiring, as awesome as an army with banners. The life application footnote would make this statement that she appears to be like a mighty army ready for battle. When battle hits your life, spiritual battle, natural battle hits your life, how do you appear to the enemy of your soul? Does he see you run and hide and whimper? <laughs> Does he see you so full of fear that you just give up and you subdue your spirit to the spirit of the enemy to bring you down? Or does he see the Spirit of God rise up within you 
and you take a positive step in a position that says, I know my God is able to do above what I could even ask or think possible. I know my God has said that there's no weapon formed against me that will prosper. I know my God has said that I can run through a troop and I can leap over a wall. We either will take a position of faith and stand against the enemy in the name of the Lord, the strength of the Lord, of course, not our own, or we will run cowardly. And instead of the enemy fleeing, we will flee. May the Lord develop us. May he complete that work within us that the enemy knows that when he begins to bother us, that he's going to stir into a hornet's nest in a sense. The things of the Spirit of God are going to be stirred up and they are going to chase him down the road. Not all battles are settled. When we're in a battle against the enemy in moments or days or hours necessarily, some are done quickly and some take more time. But the enemy needs to know who you are as a child of God and where you stand with God and that God is on your side and that God, in fact, is much bigger than he is and that he's no match for the power of the Holy Ghost operating in your life. I think the church in particular, instead of being a cowardly church, we need to be a fearless church, full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost, like it speaks of those in the New Testament that laid the foundation of the doctrine of Christianity. The scripture speaks of those how they were full of faith and they were full of the Holy Ghost. You know, we can have a lot of faith, but do we have much of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Spirit the dunamis of God, the dynamite of God, do we have that operating in our life? Now, that doesn't just happen. That is a result of spending time in the presence of God and seeking the face of God, standing upon His Word and taking our position in identification with Jesus Christ. There's things that make that possible. It doesn't just happen automatically. I would suggest that if you're a believer and you haven't yet been filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that you would seek the Lord, that you might be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit so that you will not be a wimp in the sight of the enemy. As an individual and in old church, how we need to see the operation of the Holy Ghost in our midst again. I'm so grateful that especially in my youth, the people were just a number of people in those days, uh, mainly that were serving the Lord, but they were a people that knew how to pray. They knew how to fast. They knew how to seek God in a way that tremendous things happened, that glorified God. Miracles took place. The dead were raised. Thank God I'm hearing testimonies that many of the foreign countries, the Spirit of God is sweeping through those countries. The Holy Ghost is filling people with the Spirit in a way that these mighty signs and wonders are following the life of the individual believer as well as the church collectively. I'm afraid that much of the Church of the West has been lulled to sleep or to just a comfortable lifestyle. We don't know how to, to invest our life in a sacrificial way and in a consecrating way to seek the face of God so that the presence and the power of God is in our midst. You know, when you read in the New Testament, it says of how when the unbeliever comes in, the Spirit of God should be moving so that he knows by the workings of the gifts of the Spirit, that God is true, that God knows who He is. And, and, and in fact, God knows the very count of the number of hair on His head. I'm not saying that we have to be scary in the flesh or be weird in the flesh. No, but there's something about the power and the presence of God that people should sense it even when they begin to come nigh unto our gatherings. When they come nigh to the doorway and the entrance thereof, they should sense that there's a presence here. There's a power here, not just a bunch of noise. I'm not talking about a bunch of noise and a bunch of emotionalism as a substitute, but I'm talking about the real thing where men are convicted of their sin, where the works of God are being manifested in the healing of bodies in, in lives being straightened out, people being delivered from their bondages and even the dead raised. Yes, amen. She is seen for the power of God manifested in her life when we're talking about the Shulamite, the complete one, as our example of letting God complete his work in us. Right now, 
So many of us, our life only reflects a partial work of God. That's why we must pursue the things of the Lord so that work can be completed within us as we endeavor to complete our course. The onlookers of the Shulamite, they said of her when they watched her, they said, well, she's terrible as an army with banners. She's She's frightening. She's awesome. She's captivating. No, she was not some ragtag band. The church of God today is not to be some ragtag band. The church of God is to stand up like the army of the Lord on this earth and hold their banners high. What about the banners? What does the scripture have to say about the banners? Well, banners here that is spoken of in the Song of Solomon, it is referring to perhaps a flag, an ensign or a standard, that which would be an emblem held up high on a pole. And the children of Israel, when they were traveling in the wilderness, each tribe would raise their identifying standard. On the pole would be an emblem that symbolized who they were, whether were they of the camp of Dan, were they of the camp of Judah, whoever they might be, they had their unique particular banner that they raised, and this identified them. And especially in warfare, their banners would, would identify the different regiments. On that uh, pole, the emblem could be either a sacred emblem, perhaps. It might even be the name of their king or a picture of their king. Child of God, our banner that we raise before the Lord in a symbolic sense, it should have the name of our king, king of kings and lord of lords. It should represent the face of our Lord when we hold it high before the powers of hell that want to come against us. Because Jesus said that he would build his church and the gates of hell would not be able to prevail against her. Well, that's, that's referring to some kind of a conflict, some kind of a battle, isn't it? Well, we need to raise our banner high, and our banner should be the name of the Lord. Because as we identify with Jesus Christ and his name, this is our authority. Isn't it wonderful that he left with us the privilege of using his name. Didn't he say, in my name, they shall cast out devils. In my name, they shall heal the sick. In my name. Oh, I'm so grateful that I don't have to go in the name of Carol Brook because I wouldn't get two feet. I wouldn't accomplish anything at all if I had to go in my name. But we can take up the name of the Lord and raise it high as on a pole. Our standard, our emblem, our banner is the name of the Lord God most high. And I think of how Moses in Exodus 17, ladies, we won't turn there for sake of time. But we could read there that after a historic battle, when he defeated the Amalekites, he built an altar unto God to worship and praise God for that victory. And what did he do? He named that altar in that place. The Lord is my banner. The Lord is my banner. Who's your banner? When the enemy comes in like a flood against you and things just seem to roll in, the unexpected, that which is perplexing, that which could be defeating or destroying, what do you raise up? Raise up the banner of the name of the Lord. He says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. There is that banner. Like I said, it could be a flag, a standard, an ensign. They all represent the same type of thing. What is... What is the banner doing? It's acknowledging when it's in the name of the Lord that all our strength comes from the Lord, that we do not fight our warfare as flesh and blood, but we fight in the realm of the Spirit through the name of the Lord, through what He has done, because He spoiled principalities and powers at the cross, the Scripture says. He took that which was captivating and He made it it's His captive. It says when He ascended on high... He took captive that which would captivate. Oh, thank God that Jesus overcame not only death, hell, and the grave, but he overcame principalities and powers and spoiled them there at the cross. I think of how little David, ladies, when he had to face Goliath, he came out against Goliath not only with his little rocks in his, in his bag, in his little uh, probably shepherd bag that he had for his slingshot, but he came 
came at Goliath, saying to him, you come at me with your spear, but I come to you, he said, in the name of the Lord. Yes, he knew how to use the name of the Lord. That was his banner. The hosts of hell could see what was little David's banner. His standard that he held high was the power of the name of the Lord. Oh, there is power in the blood, isn't there? There's power in the blood that he shed at the cross. I'm so glad that the power of the blood is manifested even yet today. Psalms 20 verse 5 speaks of our banners. And it says in the King James, We will rejoice in thy salvation. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. How will you set up your banners? You will surely set it up in the name of the Lord. Once you have learned that you cannot win in your own strength, but in the name of the Lord, there is power. There is power, child of God. Perhaps you're listening to me today and you say, oh, Carol, it seems like the enemy has just encircled around me. I feel like he's set up an encampment against me. I don't know what to do. Child of God, raise up your standard. Raise up your bandard. Say, raise up your ensign. Let it be that your King of kings and Lord of lords is lifted high. Do it by faith. Do it by proclamation. Lift up your voice on high, even if you have to do it out loud against the forces of darkness that are battering at your door. And say, in the name of the Lord, I will not be denied. In the name of the Lord, I will not be defeated. Take your stand on some promise of God that God has quickened to you and do not be defeated. Do not be denied because your God is able to bring you out with a mighty hand. It's not all about you. It's not because of you. It'll be in spite of you. But the Spirit of God will manifest himself if you put your trust in him and stake your claim in him. He will not let his name go down to defeat to the mud but he will raise up a victory even in the midst of the hosts of hell. The, the psalmist said this, that the Lord had prepared for him a table even in the presence of his enemies. Yes, the Lord can not only give you the victory, but he can spread you a feast and the enemy will have to stand back and watch you eat it. He can prepare for you a feast of godly spoil from the battle that you're now in. And the enemy will just have to stand back and watch because God is on your side. Oh, his strong arm, his right hand. The word of God is precious, child of God. You need to begin to build a reservoir that you can draw out of in times of battle, in times of need, and stand on those promises of the Lord and see victories won. Like I said, not all victories are won immediately. Some are. Some of them are short-term but some of them may take a bit of endurance. And I think of how Daniel, he prayed and he fought against the powers of darkness and enemy was trying to defeat his prayers. And it was 21 days before his prayers really brought forth the victory. If you're hanging on by faith and by prayer and supplication for a victory, do not give up. Do not lay your equipment down, but be a true soldier. The scripture says to endure hardness, like a good soldier, I feel I'm speaking to someone who is battle weary and you're just tired of trying to hold on to see the light of day. The Lord is faithful, child of God. Do not give up. Do not, do not turn aside and give the enemy the advantage over your life. Do not say, well, the Lord hasn't delivered yet and so I just quit. Don't do that. Yet see what God is able to do. I want us to consider that again. Song of Solomon 6.10, Who is she that looketh forth as the morning fair, as the moon clears the sun, and terrible as an army with banners? Yes, she is frightening to the hosts of hell. You know, when Jesus came to shore there among the Gadarene community and, uh, of Gadira, and the, the man of the tombs saw Jesus coming to land and approaching his way, those demons inside of him began to cry out. There were times when the demonic forces would cry out. They would say, what have you come to torment us before our time? I mean, they knew and recognized the power of God in our Lord. I think of the time when there were um, 
those that wanted to take up the name of the Lord and not rightfully so. And the demons said, you know, who are you? Who are you? Paul, we know, but who are you? It should be so that the enemy recognizes and knows who you are because of your relationship with the Lord. We wouldn't want the enemy to look at us and say, well, who are you? In other words, you know, you're no, you're no threat. The Spirit of God in our life can intimidate the powers of darkness. And that's the way the church should be seen. As terrible as an army with banners, that we are as an army ready for battle. Are we ready? Are, are we getting ready, ladies? Are we getting ready? Are we just, uh, you know, taking it easy, trying to find a place that's comfortable, and just coasting along? You know, this is about a warfare. The Lord didn't invite you, as I have said before, to a picnic. He didn't invite you to La La Land, where it's just a place of re recreation and rest. There's times for that, yes, but the Lord has invited you to be a part of the army of the Lord. So we will set up our banners in the name of the Lord. The body of Christ needs to be a powerful, victorious army, individually and collectively. We need to be equipped, armed, like in Ephesians 6. We need to have some experience behind us, and the only way we're going to get that is if we get involved. We need to be confident of the outcome of our battle that, by God, we will win. Because the scripture says he always leads us in triumph. What is the purpose of an army? Normally it would be to conquer the enemy's territory. Oh, yes. Is the church just standing on the fringes? Or are we invading the enemy's territory and taking dominion? There's a place for us as the children of God to move in with the troops of God and to conquer and take some of the enemy's territory. Have you, have you begun to pray, pray, any of you ladies, and you, my listener, about some of the ungodly things taking place on your block or in your neighborhood, in your vicinity, some ungodly things going on there? Have you realized that you could pray that place to be closed, shut down, removed, away from your area? We need to conquer the enemy's territory, not stand back helpless and watch evil prevail. We need to, to see the Spirit of God use us to defend the kingdom of God as well. That's the purpose of an army, to conquer territory and to defend the home. Where are we going to get such power? We're going to get it through the Holy Spirit. It's going to come from spending time with God in His Word and in prayer, just in His presence, soaking in His presence. I'm going to quote some scriptures quickly, but you might want to jot them down. In Acts 1.8, it says, When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall receive power from on high. Luke 24.49, it says, We will be clothed with power from on high. Mark 16, verse 17 through 18, it says the signs are going to follow the believers. And it speaks of the dynamics of the Holy Ghost operating through the people of God. In 1 Corinthians 12, you can read the list my friend, of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that God uses as tools and equipment to get this job done like an army going forth to cast down the powers of darkness. And I want to especially bring to your mind 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 for the scripture there says in the King James, for God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Oh, don't you want to let the Lord complete his work in you more and more that you might finish your course like the Shulamite and be considered a completed one, one that the Holy Spirit has been able to have right away in and do his will and work through. Next program, we're going to talk about what do you see in her, and we're going to talk about her backup, her backup as she does battle. May the Lord bless you and strengthen you is my prayer. I trust that the word of God will do you good and that you'll be encouraged and you will pursue the things of God with all that you have. Until our next program, God bless you and keep you. I pray amen. Let flowers bloom, O oh Lord, where tears have fallen. Let our hearts as you
Program copies available. Full set of 12 lessons on CDs, $34. DVDs, $44. Add $3 for shipping and handling, no COD. Original Carol Brooks song album, audio cassettes, $10 each. CDs, $14 each. Add $3 for shipping and handling, no COD. For orders and support gifts only, call 619-445-4748, Pacific Time, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., or visit our website at www.carolbrookministries.com. For more information, please contact Carol Brook Ministries Incorporated, P.O. Box 1909, Alpine, California, 91903. On the Internet, visit www.carolbrookministries.com or email carolbrook at carolbrookministries.com. Prayer line number 541-592-4539, Pacific Time, 8 a.m. through 8 p.m.